Good afternoon, Salesian High School family, to our students, faculty and staff, family and friends, and all those who are watching. We welcome you today to our Salesian High School Lenten prayer service. And Lent is the special time of the church when we prepare ourselves for Easter. We prepare in many ways, such as almsgiving, as we have seen here, our young men have donated, and as well as families, donated over a thousand diapers. We prepare in prayer, what we will be doing today, through penance, through good works, fasting, and most importantly, sacrificing. We renew our faith and reflect on Jesus, the love he shows us, the life that he is living, as well as him dying and rising for us. He is our Savior and our Lord. He has redeemed us from our sins. He has given us eternal life. Let us all come together today in all one body, as one spirit, and pray for those who have been victims of COVID-19. We pray for our world leaders. We pray for those who have gone before us. Most importantly, we always remember Mr. J and his family. We pray for all first responders, we pray for all essential workers, and most importantly, we pray for you, our Salesian High School family. We hope that this time will help you reflect on our Lenten season, and most importantly, prepare us all for Easter. I wish everyone a happy Easter and a safe holiday. Enjoy. During Lent, we strive to free ourselves from all kinds of clutter, material and spiritual, in order to focus on God and turn back to him with our whole hearts. If this turning back is genuine, it will be a reorientation and a transformation. God extends his invitation of authentic transformation to each of us to embrace as individuals and as a community. May we be open to the Lord's invitation during the season of Lent with a renewed desire to live our lives as he intended always outward looking, giving of ourselves and willing to sacrifice for the benefit of others. When this is over, may we never again take for granted a handshake with a stranger, conversations with neighbors, a crowded theater, a Friday night out, the taste of communion, a routine checkup, the school rush each morning, coffee with a friend, a roaring stadium, each deep breath, a boring Tuesday or life itself. When this ends, may we find that we have become more like the people we wanted to be, we were called to be, we hope to be. And may we stay that way, better for each other because of the worst. A reading from Isaiah. Lord Yahweh has given me a disciple's tongue for me to know how to give a word of comfort to the weary. Morning by morning, he makes my ear alert to listen like a disciple. Lord Yahweh has opened my ear, and I have not resisted. I have not turned away. I have offered my back to those who struck me, my cheeks to those who plucked my beard. I have not turned my face away from insult and spitting. Lord Yahweh comes to my help. This is why insult has not touched, has not touched me. This is why I have set my face like a flint, and I know that I shall not be put to shame. He who grants me saving justice is near. Who will, who will bring a case against me? Let us appear in court together. Who has a case against me? Let him approach me. Look, Lord Yahweh, is coming to my help. Who dares condemn me? Look at them, all falling apart like moth-eaten clothes. The word of the Lord. The response is, commit your life to the Lord and he will help you. Trust in the Lord and do good, that you may dwell in the land and be fed in security. Take delight in the Lord and he will grant you your heart's request. Commit your life to the Lord, and he will help you. The Lord watches over the lives of the wholehearted. The inheritance lasts forever. They are not put to shame in an evil time. In days of famine, they have plenty. Commit your life to the Lord, and he will help you. Turn evil and do good, that you may abide forever. For the Lord loves what is right, and forsakes not his faithful ones. Commit your life to the Lord, and he will help you. The salvation of the just is from the Lord. He is the refuge in time of distress, and the Lord helps them and delivers them. He delivers them from the wicked and saves them because they take refuge in him. Commit your life to the Lord and he will help you. 
the one of the twelve, the man called Judas Iscariot, went to the chief priests and said, Where are you prepared to give me if I hand them over to you? They paid him thirty silver pieces. And from then onward, he began to look for an opportunity to betray him. Now, on the first day of the unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus to say, Where do you want us to make the preparations for you to eat at the Passover? He said, Go to a certain man in the city and say to him, the master says, My time is near. It is at your house that I am keeping Passover with my disciples. The disciples did what Jesus told them and prepared for Passover. When evening came, he was at the table with the twelve. And while they were eating, he said, In truth I tell you, one of you is about to betray me. They, they were greatly distressed and started asking him in turn, Not me, Lord, surely. He answered, Someone who has dipped his hand into the dish will, will betray me. The Son of Man is going to his fate, as the scripture says he will. But alas for the man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. Better for the man if he had never been born. Judas, who was to betray him, asked him in turn, Not me, Rabbi, surely. Jesus answered, It is who, say. We hear the gospel today once again, reminding us of some of the important features of what has been going on during the passion and betrayal of Jesus. One of the central characters that we hear throughout Holy Week and at this moment it culminates is Judas. And we have to really think about the importance of Judas in the role that, uh, that the passion has in our lives and also in the salvation of all humankind. Because we're told something about the character of Judas. They were told, at the very beginning, that he got seduced by money. He wanted to be able to put his hand into the, the, the collections that were available to him and use them for himself. He's going to sell Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, rather than look for the ways that he could help, as he said he was, the poor. Seduced by that power and the, and the, the luxury that it could afford him, he decides that he's going to plot from then on, because he knows that he can make more money if he's able to betray Christ. We have to look into our own hearts to look at the ways that we can sometimes be twisted in the way that we want to think about Jesus and the way that we're willing to sell out of Jesus. That is, there's a better offer, if there's something else that seems a bit more pleasurable, there's something else that gives us more satisfaction, that we can simply betray Christ and look to plot him, not in a way of, of ex ex executing him in the way that Judas was going to do that, but instead to look at the ways that we can silence his voice, to eliminate the possibility that he could continue to speak and change minds and change hearts. He had invited Judas to participate in the inner circle. Judas had been there. He's at the Last Supper. He's there sharing in a meal. And in the midst of that, Jesus aware of what is going to happen, starts to unfold the character of Judas before us. And so we, we hear Jesus speaking, knowing what Judas is about to do. It's hard to imagine what must have been going on in Jesus' mind as he's, as, he, as he's thinking about what's going to happen in the next few hours, knowing that it is about to be tortured, that he's going to be crucified as a result of this betrayal by Judas. He knows it, and he doesn't stop it. He allows Judas to go through with everything that he said that he was going to do. And I think that that must have been very, very troubling for him. He gave him a chance to repent. He speaks to everyone and says, look, there is someone in you, there's 12 that are here with me at dinner. One of you is going to betray me. And we have all the disciples, surely not I, surely not I, surely not I. They knew that their consciences were clear. And then we come to Judas at the end. Surely it is not I, Lord. And Jesus exposes his hypocrisy right away and says, it is you who say it. He knew, and then later on tells him, go and do what you must do quickly. He's accepting that, yes, he gave the opportunity for repentance and for change of heart, and Judas rejected it. 
It's a challenge for us to look at the ways that we are sometimes offered by God to our conscience, calling us back to change a particular habit of sin, a way of looking at other people, the way of looking at life. And Jesus says, change your mind, change your heart, come back to me. How often have we tried to pretend that we wanted to be honest and legitimate? Jesus accepted his, the, his betrayal, but with great sorrow. He knows that good will will come, good will come, even as he is betrayed, that at the end, evil and death and sin will not conquer. He shows his ultimate power, the power of forgiveness, the power of compassion, the power of looking for reconciliation with those who offend and those who hurt. Jesus sees long term. He doesn't just look at this one particular moment. He sees the further opportunities throughout the person's life to be able to allow them to come to salvation. And so he's able to use even that which on the surface seems to be evil and destructive to be something that could be a source of life and of goodness. Even though evil seems to be winning, goodness conquers. It's a powerful victory, a prayer that is involved. We're called to be people of resurrection, of new life, of hope. Our struggles, our difficulties don't have to defeat us. They don't have to make us simply die and give up. Instead, we have to learn now to light a candle rather than curse the darkness, to look for the ways that we can be the kinds of people that God has called us to be, to hear his call and to heed it. Judas wasn't able to, uh, to accept Jesus' offer. We, we don't have to imitate him. Instead, we need to imitate Jesus in accepting the will of the Father for us and doing all that we can in the world in order to be people of integrity, people of goodness, people of compassion, people of repentance. Have a blessed Easter. Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Oh, sinner, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door. Somebody's knocking at your door Oh, sinner, why don't you answer? Somebody's knocking at your door Let's not forget also the cross that is right behind me, what Christ did for each and every one of us, how he saved us through the cross, 
And so we enter into a year over the pandemic and yet we still have some distancing, but let's not remember that Christ never distanced himself away from us. In fact, he became, God became one of us so that we can enter into heaven. And so this is what we celebrate this Holy Week. This is what we remember. And there is nothing that can separate us from the love of God, St. Paul says. And so let's get close to Christ this Holy Week. Let's get close to one another in the safest, most possible way because ultimately that's what Christ wants. He wants all of us to be united to him in paradise. And so let's experience this joy of Easter and the resurrection. We thank you for calling us to be ambassadors of your love to all. Open our hearts day by day to see and serve those needs that we are able to meet in our communities and in our neighborhoods. Give us wisdom to discern and support those policies and leaders that can best serve your dream of holiness for your whole creation. Deliver us from the temptations of doubt and despair and give us courage to live always in hope, however countercultural that may sometimes seem. Give strength and skill to all those who minister to the sick. Prosper the means made use for this, their cure. Grant that, perceiving how frail and uncertain our life is, we may apply our hearts onto the heavenly wisdom which led us to eternal life. God of all comfort, we pray for those who have been, who are, and who will be affected by all that encompasses COVID-19. The physical, mental, spiritual, emotional, and financial burdens are great. We know that not everyone is affected equally or justly. We pray especially for those who are risking their lives for the protection of others. And we pray mightily with and for those whose voices often go in rain. We ask you that you will look upon those who the world tries to look away from. May they know especially that they are heard, they are held, and they are loved. May they know your truth in a world full of lies. May they know your protection in a world full of violence. And may they know your abundance in a world full of poverty. No one child should have to fight so hard for the inheritance that you so freely gave to all. Deliver us from simply desiring to go back to normal and give us grace instead to be open to the opportunities that your spirit brings in this time of separation. Grant that we may come out of this crisis with fully open eyes, more fully available to the needs of those most vulnerable and those whose labor we have always depended on. Resurrected Lord, Dwell in each of our hearts, in each person who has been hospitalized, in all medical personnel, in priests and pastors, in the rulers of the nations and civic leaders, in our families at home, in our grandparents, in those who are in prison, who are afflicted, who are oppressed and mistreated, in those who do not have their daily bread, in those who have lost a loved one because of COVID-19 or some other condition. Give us creative hearts to embrace and carry forward the new ways we have found to connect with one another. And in your good time, bring us safely back together as people renewed in the knowledge of your faithfulness and abiding love and strengthened for the work ahead. May the resurrected Christ bring us hope, strengthen our faith, fill us with love and kingship, and grant us with his peace. One. So, there are two tragic figures in the Gospel of Holy Week. One of them we heard read a little earlier in, the, in this service. The other one we know about, especially if we read the Gospel of Sunday or this coming Friday. We have Judas, who was looking, as the Gospel says, for any opportunity to hand Jesus over, and he did. And he sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. A little later, we see Peter, who says to Jesus, Lord, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And Jesus brings Peter back to his senses and says, Before the cock grows twice, you will deny me three times. The difference between Judas and Peter is that Peter, once he committed that sin of betrayal, knew that he had done the wrong thing. And later on, after Jesus' resurrection, Jesus comes to Peter and says, Peter, do you love me? And, Jesus, and Peter says, of course I do. Feed my lambs. And Jesus asks Peter a second time, 
Simon Peter, do you love me more, th more than these? And Peter says, of course I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. Third time, Jesus asks Peter, Simon, do you love me more than these? And Peter's a bit exasperated. He says, you know, Lord, that I love you. You know all things. And Jesus says again, feed my sheep. This is the gospel's way of saying that Jesus forgives Peter for his betrayal. And Peter had the humility to ask for forgiveness. Judas, on the other hand, continues to be the tragic figure because he cannot, once he realizes he has done wrong, he cannot ask Jesus' forgiveness. And as the gospel tell us, he went off, threw the money back on the floor of the temple treasury, and went off and hung himself. Two sinners, two different endings. Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil, Easter Sunday. Remind us of this important fact. We are all sinners, every one of us. From the one of us who thinks that he is the best to the one who thinks he's the most miserable, we are all sinners. Beloved, beloved sinners, but still sinners. These three days tell us that Jesus is willing to forgive us, which is why he died for us. And which is why, to show that his death meant something, the Father raised him from the dead. And so we have a choice in our lives. We can choose to be like Judas, fall into despair, kill ourselves. And I don't mean that literally, but I mean that perhaps figuratively, by refusing to accept God's love in our lives. Or we can be like Peter, who recognized and acknowledged his sinfulness and allowed himself to be forgiven by the Lord. This is what Easter is about, the story of forgiveness and starting again. May we, first of all, in this Easter season, have the ability to forgive ourselves for the times that we have done things that we think cannot be forgiven, for the times that we are too hard on ourselves, for the times that we debase ourselves. Can we forgive ourselves? Secondly, can we forgive those who have offended us? Whether it's our parents, our siblings, our teachers, our friends, those with whom we may not be friendly, do we have the ability to forgive as Jesus has forgiven us? And third of all, are we able to have God forgive us? Are our hearts open to accept God's forgiveness? This is the story of Easter. It is a sort of forgiveness of love and of open hearts. May all of us have a blessed Easter, not only on Easter Sunday, but throughout the season. Have a good vacation. See you on April 12th. Have a good day.